But here's the thing. We are a church that's about Jesus. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He is God in the flesh. He is the reason for our being and our living. And so as a church, we say, how do we live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ? How do we live out, good to see you, how do we live out um, what it means to proclaim Him as Lord every day of our lives? And so we have been talking about things that we value of how we live that out, how, how we carry that out, how we make that real. We've talked about uh, discipleship. We've talked about that we value honor. We've talked about that we value belonging. Last week we talked about that we value the presence of God. And, and today what I want to talk to you about is that we value joyful identity. Now uh, you're saying, what could that possibly mean? Okay, but see, here's the thing. I, I mean, you know the movies, right? The murder mystery where you see, you know, who's the murderer, and it's always the last person you suspect. It's the little blue-haired lady with the handbag, right? And, and she is like the sinister mastermind of some evil plot. Or, or you go and you see the superhero movies, right? And you see the meek, mild-mannered whoever is now this super incredible person. Because what happens is, is that as you get into the story, they reveal who they truly are. You see, we have two sides of us, right? The side that we present to people is what we think they want to see us as or what we want others to see us as. But, but deep down inside, there is an identity that, that marks who we really are, and it is the core of our personality. It's what drives us. It's our value. It's our, our character. It's our mission. It's our um, agenda. And, and so here's, here's the question for today. Where is your true identity found? Where is your true identity found? And do you identify yourself in terms of your job or, or your marriage or your role as a parent? Or maybe it's a certain hobby or a passion. But, but here's the problem, if that is the case, because why don't these stand the test of the time? Because, you know, some marriages end. Jobs are lost. Kids grow up. Golfers lose their putter. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> But um, or swing. Maybe I should say swing. I'll get that right second hour. But, uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that, that if that is the way we identify ourselves, if our whole identity, our whole self-worth, our whole being is found in those things, they won't last. Um, I remember I had someone uh, that said to me once, early on in my marriage, he said, pray that your wife would love Jesus more than you. And I got to admit, I, I, was, I was kind of offended. I was like, well, what do you mean? I was, I was like, really? Well, why would I want to pray that? He says, because here's the thing. He says, someday you may die. I said, well, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen at some point, right? And he says, and, 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 and if your wife is the one who survives you, if you are her whole purpose for reason, when you die, so dies her purpose. So dies her identity. If she identifies herself as Sean's wife, and that is all that there is to who she is, that when I go, that's it, all done. But see, what, what I want you to see is the only identity that lasts, the only one that brings us lasting joy, is identity that's found in Jesus Christ. That's why that song is so important. I am a child of God. Because you see, when people tell you you're worthless, when people tell you you have no value, when people say you're never going to be good enough, when you lose your job, when the marriage ends, when the kids grow up, when the golfer loses their putter, whatever you want to say, you say, this is where my identity is found. My identity, my value, my worth is found in Christ. And, and, and so that's one of the things we value so much because we believe that when your identity is found in Christ, that you will be able to weather the storms. You will be able to weather uh, the, the cruel remarks, the hurtful things that are done to you because now your identity is found in something else than something that will not last or stand up to that type of pressure. So, so here's where I just want to start and share today is that when my identity is found in Christ, I have victory in Jesus, which frees me from the enemy. Listen to these words in Romans chapter 8. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. 
The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Now, did you hear that? There's this low-lying black cloud, and here, what we hear is that Christ clears the air. You can breathe again. This is who Jesus is. Jesus said this way, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. I remember the first time I read that, I heard, oh, prisoners. I was thinking of people who were in jail, right? But, but here's the thing, is that I've been a prisoner. You've been a prisoner. At some point or other, every person in this room has been in a prisoner. You, you, you've been a prisoner if you have believed the lie that you would never be worth it. You, have, uh, you are a prisoner if you believe when people tell you you'll never be good enough. You are a prisoner um, if you uh, believe the lies or, or you're held captive by your anger, your addictions, your lust, your jealousy, your gossip, your covetousness. I mean, the, we could just go on and on, right? And if I go on long enough, eventually I'm going to hit the one that's you, right? Because it's not too hard for me to hit the one that's me. And when I, when I think of that, when I, when I hear those words, I, I, I realize that, that, see, this is the whole point of Christ's coming, to set the prisoner free. Now, now here's the hard part. Um, I think there are a lot of people here today, in this room right now, who have gone through a hurt that has defined them. And they've lived out that hurt and played the part that they told they were. So if you had a parent who told you that you were stupid, if you had someone tell you you were fat, if you had someone tell you that you would never be good enough, and it, and it comes from all places. I, I don't know why I picked on parents today. Um, because it comes from so many places. But, but, but the thing is that, that what Jesus says to you is that you are not defined by your past. That's important for you to hear today. God does not hold my sins against me. I am also no longer bound by my sin. Sickness lies as I now live freely with this power of righteousness, healing, truth, and joy. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What happens when we're reconciled? That which was broken is made right. That which was broken is restored. That which was captive is set free. And this is who you are truly meant to be. See, this is the problem. This is who you are truly meant to be. So um, years ago, I was in a, um, I should have brought it because I still have it, believe it or not. Um, I was in a Christian book um, store and uh, there is a, a, a lamb and it says half off uh, what did it, it said this lamb is not quite right <laughs> something like that right and I was like what do you mean and it was a wind up toy and so I, 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 I wound it up right and it's and, it, and in, in the story and it starts playing Jesus loves me but it was it was there was one note somebody didn't do right because it was like <laughs> You know, and, and you just go, whoa, back on the shelf. And then I thought, wait a second, isn't that the whole point? God takes me, who's right, and he makes me whole. God takes me, who is off key, and takes the notes and makes them right. God takes you and shows you that you have value and worth. You know, um, Years ago, I, I, I was, I was kind of shocked when I realized that what I want to share with you is something that was given to me when I was in junior high. And when I started youth ministry, I remember the very first seminar I, I did was for a group of junior hires about self-image and self-esteem. And then over the years, I've read it to my kids, and I think I may have even read it here in church once a long time ago, but this is something that, that meant a lot to me. It's called I'm Special. 
Uh, I think I have some extra copies at the guest center if you, if you like it. If not, then tough. But, <laughs> but this is what it says. I'm special. In all the world, there's nobody like me. Since the beginning of time, there's never been another person like me. Nobody has my eyes, my nose, my hair, my hands, my voice. I'm special. No one can be found who has my handwriting. Nobody anywhere has my taste for food or music or art. No one sees things just as I do. In all of time, there's been no one who laughs like me, no one who cries like me. And what makes me laugh or cry will never provoke identical laughter and tears from anybody else, ever. No one reacts to any situation just as I would react. I'm special. I'm the only one in all of creation who has my set of abilities. Oh, there will always be somebody who's better at one of the things I'm good at, but no one in the universe can reach the quality of my combination of talents, ideas, abilities, and feelings. Like a room full of musical instruments, some may excel alone, but none can match the symphony sound when all are played together. I'm a symphony. Through all of eternity, no one will ever look, talk, walk, think, or do like me. I'm special, I'm rare, and in all rarity there is great value. Because of my great rare value, I need not attempt to imitate others. I will accept, yet celebrate my differences. I'm special. I'm beginning to realize it's no accident that I'm special. I'm beginning to see that God made me special for a very special purpose. He must have a job for me that no one else can do as well as I. Out of all the billions of applicants, only one is qualified. Only one has the right combination of what it takes. That one is me because I'm special. I think we all need to hear that from time to time. And, and, and when, I, when I look through Scripture, I realize that this is what God is saying to you and me. You know, I'm no longer an orphan, right? He has adopted me into his family as royalty. Listen to what Second Peter says, that you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to help others of the might, night and day differences, difference he made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Or in John we hear these words, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Isn't that what happened when Nicodemus met Jesus in the middle of the night, a religious leader who was looking for God? Probably good if you're a religious leader. And, and he went to Jesus in the middle of the night. And what does Jesus say? He says, Nicodemus, you need to understand, you need to be born again. And, and we've heard that phrase, and it, it sometimes kind of, or we kind of miss it because we've heard it so much. But, but, but what's he saying is that, that no longer do you need, can you see yourself as, as someone who is not worthy of of my love, but you see that you now belong to me. You have been born again. You have been born into the family of God when you accept me as your Lord. And Jesus said to Nicodemus that night, Nicodemus, will you be born again? And this is what God asks of us. And as we start to see ourselves through God's eyes, not through the eyes of people who have told us we'll never be good enough, but through the eyes of God as, as we have our identity and we see that our identity is found in Christ. My, I am identified as a child of God. And because I am a child of God, th then therefore that gives me a responsibility, doesn't it? Because now I am commanded to be a representative of Jesus so that others will be reconciled to him. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors Though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might in him, or that we in him, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What do ambassadors do? They represent the one they are serving, right? And if you are a child of God, if God is your heavenly father, then you need to know that there is a change because you have value and worth and this is what brings us our joyful identity. So uh, in our church with our leadership, um, we've been talking about this a lot and, and what it means. And so um, we, I've been asking my elders if they could just share how this has impacted them personally. Today is Brent, the birthday boy's turn. 
And uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Brent to come on up. So let's hear it for Brent. Okay. Yeah, so um, as Sean asked, and we're, we're going through the various cultures, and one of the ones that um, really spoke to me was joyful identity. And it's not because it comes easy for me, actually the opposite. And so, you know, I stand here before you guys um, very humbly, um, because this is something that I'm in process on. And um, so I just want to share a couple of stories, uh, take you back over 20 years ago, 1997, Janine and I had just been married a couple of years. Woo Chandler was one, <laughs> a little bigger than he was when he was one. Um, and uh, I told Janine, I came home from work, I'm like, oh man, there's this great opportunity we're moving to Sacramento. I've got it all figured out. We're going. I've got the whole vision and plan. We're going to live. Her sister lives up in the Sacramento area. You can live next to your sister. It, we're just go, go, go. This is all going to work. I go up there. Nope. Not going to happen. Got the door slammed in my face. And it was all because... In my walk with God at that time, it was all about me. Hmm. It was my flesh, and it was my idea, and I thought I just had our whole lives planned out. And so we were still back in Orange County at the time, and uh, Chandler went from one to two, and now it's 1998, and it felt like an eternity. And this opportunity come up to move to the Bay Area. And we're like, Bay Area? We know no one there. San Francisco, there's like a lot of crazy people that live in the <laughs> Bay Area. We're like, can we do this? And, um, you know, so we came up and kind of explored and go, oh, there's this thing called the East Bay that's maybe not as quite as scary as... San Francisco, and you can actually get a house and not live, you know, in a, in a flat with no yard and that sort of thing. And so we were excited yet scared. And, um, but what was different this time is that Janine and I, as a young married couple with a two-year-old, we, we got closer than ever. Um, and when you and your spouse move, get closer together, you're closer to God in that triangle. And um, it was no longer about, you know, me or my family. It was, okay, God, you got this. What, do you, what are you going to teach us? And we moved to Clayton in 1998 with a two-year-old. And Janine was pregnant with Lexi at the time, and we knew no one. And we're like, okay, God, this is our faith journey. We're just going to do this. And I told Janine, I said, we just, have to, we just have to do this for two years. That was my commitment because the company was moving us up here. And it's like, all right, we can do anything for two years. That was 22 years ago, right? <laughs> um, and so... I think it was maybe six months into that, our company got bought out. And I was the new guy in the Bay Area, right? I had just come up here, and so who's the first one to get the layoff notice, right? So that was me, because I was the new guy. And I'm like, OK, God, you got this, but don't know what this really means. And what was really cool is I know I came to Sean several times, completely freaked out. But I had Sean as a great friend. I had an entire men's group that had my back. We were meeting at uh, Country Waffle at 6 a.m. on Thursday mornings. Um, and I felt like I had a 
had friends, had family, had the church family come around us. Um, you know, again, it was my flesh had fear, but then I was still growing in my faith. A um, few months went by, and um, my boss took my layoff notice because he's like, I really want to retire, so I'll take yours. And then the company formed a new division, and they said, oh, we'd really like you to head up this new group. Um, you know, again, it's just stuff. So whether it's your house, your job, um, you know, where is your true identity found? And so I'm still on my journey. Um, I'm really excited what God's going to do, um, whether it's, you know, continuing on with what our kids are going to do as they grow up and mature, um, where life's going to take Janine and I on our next two-year expedition, but, you know, for now, Clayton's our home. But when we started that out, we had no idea. All we knew was we trusted God, and, um, and so I, I really challenge each and every one of you here today that uh, lean into him. He will not disappoint you. Thank you. I don't know if you caught it, but one of the things Brent said is, you know, all this other stuff is just stuff. And he said it so quick, you know. Um, but one of the things I do know about Brent is I appreciate his honesty when he says, hey, I'm a work in progress too. But at the same time, um, I, 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 I've seen the change. I've seen the change. You know, that, that he is, sees himself as a child of God. And, and, and so here, here's the thing, is that that's, that's my prayer for you today. You see, we've become new creations. And by resisting sin, we are not fighting against who we were. Instead, we are cooperating with our new selves, with him, and who we are now. Paul says this in Ephesians, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Because you see, this is what God does. He, he lifts off shame and condemnations so that we can have freedom, joy, blessing, and abundant life. Romans 5.5 5 says, Hope does not put us to shame because God love, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 10.1, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And see, this is where the, the change happens. Is we're to renew our minds, establish new habits of the heart by declaring his truth and his promises. Romans 12.2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It, it almost sounds like a reboot, doesn't it? And in many ways, maybe that, that's what it is. It is see, see, how you see yourself, how you see others. I mean, you know, if, if Brent's whole value was found in his job, man, that, that, that would be a rough time, wouldn't it? And, 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 and so here's the thing. Is, is, do not misunderstand this. Um, because as we see ourselves as royalty, someone says, well, that sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? But, but see, it, uh, quite the opposite. If I am a child of God, that calls me to a, a new way of living. Not um, an entitlement, which so many people have these days, but, but a, a responsibility. God come, calls us to be humble servant leaders, not demanding, not the center of attention. Um, Jesus had this to say, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus had a quiet confidence in knowing who he was and who he belonged to. And, and so do I and so do you, because I know who I belong to. My value and identity is found in Jesus. And, and just like Brent said, we are all a work in progress, right? Just in case you were wondering. If you're saying, man, you know what, I don't know if I'm there yet. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Um, 
I think Leslie, is Leslie here in here this morning? I, Leslie, if you see Leslie in the children's program, what does her shirt say? I'm a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be the company shirt right now, really. But, you know, uh, because, because, see, we're, we're all growing into the fullness of Christ. I, I, you know, and I think of Paul, you know, Paul, this great saying of the church, this is what he had to say. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. And he says this great bull proclamation, and then these are his next words. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, this is the man I want to be. And this is the man I will be. And there are things that I regret. And there are things that you regret. And there are times when we have fallen short. And there are times when we have failed. And guess what? That's part of life. And it doesn't mean that God has abandoned or forgotten us. Just because things have not worked out the way you planned does not mean it's because God dislikes you. Or God says you have any less worth. It doesn't mean that you have been forgotten by God. It doesn't mean that you are a failure. What it means is that God is still at work and there is still more to be done. And instead of holding on to the past, you forget what is behind, you strain to what is ahead, you press on, you press on, you press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. So one of my favorite things right now is, you know, we've got this great staff, right? All our staff, um, I I just truly love. and, And I watch them press on. Um, and so I don't know if you know that Jamie Davis right now, is, um, he's been speaking uh, kind of throughout the Bay Area to teens, right? And so uh, he started this tour, because it sounds cooler when you say you're on tour, right? It's, uh, you know, it's so much cooler than saying, ah, I'm just going over to this school. I'm on tour. So Jamie Davis, he's on tour, okay? And, and, and so and he calls it the NB, NTBT, NTBT tour, right? And so you say, what's that? What's N-T-B? Right? I can't even do it. That's why I am no longer cool. Okay? <laughs> but it's, it's the no turning back to her. Right? Yeah, I know. And I said, Jamie, why are you doing this? He says, because I want kids to know, I want them to know that when you take a stand for Christ, there is no turning back. You press on. You look ahead. And God does not want you to quit or give up. There is no turning back. Now, Jamie can say it much better than I am. You can have him come to your school and then you can talk about it. But, but the thing is, I, I, I heard that and it, and it touched me so much because, you know, I thought, how many of us need to be reminded of that? Whether you're a kid or a high schooler or an adult or, you know, when you're just starting this Christian journey or, or, when, or whether you're kind of further along, right? That, that all of us need to be reminded that Jesus has got us that Jesus is with us, that our identity is found in him. And when we know who we belong to, there is no turning back. Because I am a child of God, I will live for him and I will accept nothing less. I will push ahead. And when I fail, I'm going to get back up. And when I fail again, I'm going to keep getting back because I know that this is God who holds on to me. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So when we sin, we need to take responsibility. When we blow it, we need to repent. That means turn our direction. We can't just keep doing the same thing. And we need to reconcile with those that our sin has affected. 1 John says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. This is who Jesus is. And this is why we follow him. He is the Lord of lords, he is the King of kings, and he has called us to be his children. And the question is not whether Jesus wants us. The question is whether you want Jesus. And my prayer is that you would accept his invitation to be his child, to belong to him, 
to see yourself through his eyes. And so here's, here's what I want to do today. I was thinking about this a lot. Um, I, I just, as I've been preparing all week, I've just been having this, this kind of sense, and I, and I think it's from, from God. We talked about the presence of God. Well, I, so I believe God's been speaking to me all week, and I'm listening. Because I just think that there are, there are several people here today who don't see themselves yet in this way. I, I believe there are people here today who have believed the lies that they'll never be enough, that they'll never have value. And even though you don't say it, and you put up a pretty good facade, the truth of the matter is that you have bought the lies. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to pray that off of you. 